Uh, my name is Dave Cabellos. I'm a product manager in the container native uh, app dev group at Oracle. Uh, with me is uh, Jason Looney. He's the vice president of enterprise architecture at Beeline. Uh, we're going to talk today um, about a few things. We're going to talk about um, Kubernetes. We're going to talk about containers. We're going to talk about hybrid use cases. Um, I think it's going to be pretty good. We'll start off with um, Oracle Safe Harbor statement. This is, you know, you'll see it in every presentation from Oracle today. Our lawyers tell us, yes, we must do this. Um, it, it is real world, right? Like, so we, we're going to talk about things that are out there today. We're going to talk about some experiences. I am going to talk about some forward looking things. And, you know, as we all know, we're all in software and things change from time to time. So that's what this is about. Um, so let's talk about containers. How many people are using containers today? Okay, maybe half the group. Um, how many people are using Kubernetes to orchestrate containers? So maybe maybe about half of that group. Okay. So when we think about containers, it's like you know containers was the thing that started to drive this the whole change in in the world of app dev, right? So you think like twelve factor was also part of this, but the notion of you know C groups and Linux. And then you know Docker came out, and it was like, okay, Docker gave us a way to, to manage these containers within a Linux environment, um, and that kind of led to, you know, adoption of, of containers in a in a bigger way. And, the, and containers gave us things like portability, DevOps, isolation uh, for these different applications. It gave us a new way to to to, to consolidate things, to manage things, to deploy applications, um, and then then you know came sort of the onslaught of containers, right? It's like, well, microservices, and, and how much more can I do here? And let's put more things in containers, and let's have more containers. The next thing you know, it's like, what do I do with all these containers? Um, and that's where you know, Kubernetes came in, right? Kubernetes, um, it's uh, the thing that orchestrates all of these containers. It's, it's the thing that says, okay, um, here's a bunch of compute capacity. What do I do? Like now I need, I know I need to run this application. It's in a container. I just needed to run so many instances of it and I needed to scale as, you know, when it needs to scale and scale down when it's done. Um, it also gives me things like um, service discovery. Where's my stuff running? So not only can I just put it into this environment, I can then query it and figure out and, and really you know, support this whole DevOps world. Um, and so Oracle's, Oracle sort of doubled down in this in this world, right? To say, we we have some services that are available today that support containers, um, and the notion is, uh, it's a it's a threefold strategy, right? It's like a complete and and if you're here in the last session too, you know we talk about Oracle builds cloud services and and the Oracle cloud itself with the notion of it's built for enterprises, right? So it's meant to be performant, reliable, and complete. Right, so we, we talk about complete here in this case of not only something like um, you know the the ability to host a Docker container, but also really to to manage it within a Kubernetes environment with the least amount of, of effort on your part. And then beyond that, beyond the the Kubernetes piece, it's a registry to hold your containers. Right, so when you create your containers, where do they, they need to go into a registry before you deploy them? And then what comes before that? Well, it's the the CI CD piece. Um, and you can use whatever you want. Oracle does provide um, a product called Container Pipelines, which is a complete, you know, container-centric um, <coughs> container build process, right? So you've got CI, CD, you've got into a registry, then you've got um, the Kubernetes piece. And then I'll talk about some future pieces coming beyond that. So complete, open. We base all of this on open source um, technology and it's not forked in any way, right? Like, so we take the open source version Excuse me, and that's what we run. Um, we do see, you know, we see some other vendors out there who don't do that. And the, the idea here is we want to be able to provide the fastest uptake of, of new features and any fixes that will come from from these open source technologies. Um, and then we also want to make make sure that everything is portable. So whatever you you can run in the open source version of these uh, products, you're going to be able to run them in Oracle Cloud. Um, and then. Managed services, right? So specifically, we talk about Kubernetes or a Docker registry. We manage that, and, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in, in a second. But the idea is we, we think we're going to win on execution here, on, on actually the, the service that we're running, the simplicity of it, the reliability of it, the performance of it. So open source, you'll be able to get that anywhere. But when you're running an Oracle Cloud, when you, when you leverage the services we provide um, in Oracle Cloud, that's, that's, you know, that's how we win. Um, and all of this really, when we talk about 
you know, hybrid, it's the Kubernetes is really the thing that makes all this available, right? Is, is to say, I want to be able to take my container, or it's containers in Kubernetes, right? I want to be able to take my container and I want to be able to move it or spread it or however that has to happen. And so Kubernetes is really the key. There are a few challenges with that, right? So again, I've, I've talked about we're going to win on simplicity and execution. The challenges for Kubernetes are really, it, it's powerful, and with power comes some complexity, and that complexity can be, you know, sort of a challenge to manage, right? To set, to, you know, to set up and maintain your control plane and your worker nodes, um, <clears throat> figuring out network and storage and security and access to your containers. Um, and then, of course, integration with things on both ends, right? Like the, you know, um, from the CI/CD into the into the registry, and then the registry beyond. And and this is where um, Oracle provides really a, you know, a, a, a spectrum of offerings here. Um, so on the left side, we see, you know, you can run it on in Oracle Cloud, you can run it on prem wherever you want. And again, this is if we think hybrid, this is enabling that. And that's um, Oracle provides really sort of the roll your own version of this, right? So Oracle Linux ships with um, a, um, a package of Kubernetes and, and um, some simple installation processes there too. In fact, it's, a, it's a scripts that leverage Kube ADM and will set up your, your um, what do you call it, your control plane and your worker nodes within Oracle Linux wherever you want to run Oracle Linux, whether that's on on-prem, like I said, or in OCI and, and uh, compute, doesn't matter. Uh, in the middle, we've got um, a Terraform installer. So that's meant, that's, you know, specific to OCI. It provides some integration to um, load balancers and the block storage within Oracle Cloud. So we're kind of taking that next step up in simplicity. Terraform, make, you know, makes it easy to just kind of roll this out. You use, you know, properties file, YAML file to say, here's, here's what I want. Terraform, you know, makes it happen and keeps it the same. Um, and then on the right really is, is the jewel here, and that's, that's um, Oracle Kubernetes Engine, or really we call it Container Engine for Kubernetes. We shorten it to OKE, and that's the fully managed service for Kubernetes. You come to, to OCI, or Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, you say, I want a Kubernetes um, cluster. You know, it asks you some questions like, what are the subnets you want to run this in? Um, um, you know, give me your SSH key, and then you say, hey, you know, what shape do I want to use for my worker nodes, and we spin up a cluster for you. And that, that's sort of a, you know, glossing over of some of the details. When we, we think about how we run this, um, you know, when, you, when you're buying uh, the Kubernetes platform within Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, you're really only buying the compute capacity that you use to run your applications, to actually host your containerized applications. The, the control plane runs within Oracle's tenancy, and Oracle manages that, makes sure it's up to date, makes sure everything keeps running. Um, we also keep the registry in that tenancy as well. So, um, you know, you can deploy your, your, or you can place your container images into this container registry, and the only thing you pay for there is, um, uh, is the block storage that you use underneath it. Um, actually, it's not block storage, it's storage in general. Um, and I just wanna, I wanna kind of take it to the next level again, kind of click down just a little bit, right? So when we think about using this in the real world, it's um, my containers are, are created as part of my CI CD process. You can plug in anything you want here. You could be using Jenkins, you can use the Oracle container pipelines, whatever it is you, you happen to use, that's fine. Push to the, to the Oracle registry. From there we push to, or we, we deploy into um, Oracle Kubernetes um, platform, right? And by default, uh, we make sure that we deploy this in, in an HA fashion. So your control plane is spread across the three availability domains within a region. Um, and you don't have to do anything to make this happen, right? We just do that. We just make sure that happens behind the scenes. We also set up the etcd service as part of the, um, the control plane. That's also in a HA. It's a you know, three-node cluster. We do regular backups. And then if there's an issue, we can, um, we can uh, restore from those backups. So it's meant to be enterprise grade out of the box. And then by default, we also expect you to kind of set up your subnets across the three availability domains, and then your worker nodes would be spread across those availability domains also. So HA out of the box. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure is, um, um, it's highly performant. I don't know if, you've, if you guys have heard much about this, but it's uh, built on a close network. So it's um, very few hops to get from, from place to place. Um, it's also a 25 GB network, so it's really fast. Uh, and then it all runs on really high-performance uh, 
compute as well. So you put all this stuff together and you've got a, you know, an enterprise version for a, a Kubernetes platform. Um, I kind of don't want to really read through all these things. Um, we're going to post the slides, but the idea is this thing, it's, it's really, it's, you know, container native. It's based on standard stuff that I mentioned before. It is developer friendly, right? It's meant to be really easy to spin up, really easy to maintain. Um, just, you know, you know, you, you need it, you got it. It's, it's ready to rock and roll. And then enterprise ready. Like I said, it's, it's built on OCI, which is itself is a, you know, an enterprise grade cloud. And then the design for managed Kubernetes within that, um, and within that environment is meant to be true enterprise grade. Uh, we talked about this already. So let's go to um, the future. So when we think about where Oracle's going with this, it's you know, not only Kubernetes, it's what do I need to run beyond that? So um, we already have you know, some of these basic pieces, the, the CI CD piece, and of course, you can plug in what you want, the, uh, the registry uh, and the Kubernetes platform. But then it's, you know, what else do I need here? I really need an end-to-end -end, um, policy management author authorization authentication system. Um, um, so that, that's that yellow bar that runs across the bottom. And then um, within Kubernetes, uh, we're seeing a lot of uptake of Istio. So Istio will be an easy add-on. It'd be like a one-click add-on to say, add this into my cluster. Um, with that, it would be we would automatically spin up the uh, the control plane for you, and then automatically add the the Envoy sidecar to each of your pods as you deploy it. This is fully customizable. Um, if you want, if you need, you know, some things to have it, some not, that's totally fine. Um, um, we, we're also uh, building an integration to the marketplace. So the, um, the marketplace within Oracle Cloud enables you to say, okay, hey, here's something out there. Let's say it's um, Cassandra. I want to run Cassandra in my in my Kubernetes cluster, you say, okay, add this on, you click through the license agreement for um, data stacks, and then you know, it installs into your, into your cluster. So meant to be really easy. Um, uh, and then we're also, um, we're also implementing the Open Service Broker API to enable us to set up service brokers that would enable you to connect to other services running in the OCI cloud. So think, I'm running an autonomous um, database for transaction processing, and I want to make it really easy to connect my containers that are running in OKE. Um, how do I do that? Well, we set up a service broker that opens the connection, opens the ports necessary, uh, sets up environment variables, your applications just use the, the connection from there. Um, and then we're also building um, a container native monitoring service uh, based on a bunch of open source pieces, right? The Elk stack, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, um, and then that'll be you know, run as a service and you just say, I want to use this service and we, we, uh, we put a, um, a push agent within, within the cluster and be able to push those things on. So this is, this is the forward looking piece. And this is, you know, we see uptake of similar things on premises. So we see people using the Elk stack and Prometheus and Grafana. We see people using Kubernetes on premise. And then, so if we think in a, um, for a hybrid world, we want to make it e really easy for you to take those workloads that you're working on premises and move those into the cloud. So Kubernetes becomes part of that, and then the rest of this open source technology becomes the piece, uh, becomes the, you know, the things that make your life easy. <clears throat> when we think about hybrid, um, there are maybe you know, five different major use cases around hybrid, right? So the one I he I've heard most and has probably been around for the longest is somebody puts dev test in the cloud, um, and then they put production on premises. And the idea there is like, hey, I, I, I have full control of what's going on in production, and I reduce my costs for, for dev and test. Um, then there's lift and shift. Basically, I've been running on premises. I want to move to the cloud. I've got a strategy to move to the cloud, and that's based on um, you know, usually cost optimizations as well as you know, possibly performance, HADR. So you know, how do I do that? And it's as, a, as my data center, as I'm, instead of replatforming what I have in my data center, I will move things to the cloud, right? So lift and shift. Um, mixed, so we see you know, some special use cases where um, you've got a system that's doing something special. Um, whether, so yesterday I heard an example where um, for like a telco company where they're running their 5G um, networking within house, right, on their premise. And then the work that they need to do related to that has to stay on premise. So those applications are gonna run on premises. But um, the things like, you know, the ERP system can run in, in the cloud somewhere, or even like, you know, the logging and the data warehousing, all that can run in the cloud somewhere. Um, so that's the, you know, at least one mixed 
workload. I've heard trading apps similar, like my, my trades have to happen close to, close to um, you know, where the data is and so forth, but, but the other pieces can be in the cloud. Um, and then the last thing really is, is bursting, and that's where I'm, you know, I'm running something somewhere on premises and then I need to burst into the cloud. That one's a little more complex and your application has to be architected to be able to handle that, right? Like wherever your data is, you know, where you're doing reads and writes from, all that needs to be, um, needs to be sort of built into the application to be able to handle that. Um, and I think what we're seeing so far is um, with the Kubernetes world, most of these are handled, you know, almost automatically. Um, and I think we're gonna hear from Jason, who's gonna talk about, you know, their journey to the cloud and how these hybrid use cases are kind of built into that whole journey. Um, so Jason, you wanna? Hi. Uh, my name is Jason Looney. I work for a company called Beeline. Um, we are a vendor management system. We, uh, 450 employees spread across the world. We deal with lots of data. We have exadatas, we have um, a legacy application. And when I say legacy, um, kind of look like that at times. <laughs> um, that's not all silly string, that's network cables. Um, it's not pretty. The, the journey we've been on, though, is kind of, um, kind of interesting. This is our architecture from 2010. So uh, everything was connected. These are old WebLogic servers. Um, we're kind of a, a great use case for Oracle because what happened is, is we had an Exadata because we needed one for performance. Our performance was pretty bad in certain cases. We put an Exadata in and that was great, we sped up, but we still have this kind of legacy architecture that was slowing us down. Huge web logic nodes, 10, 20 gigabyte heap spaces, and they're all interconnected. So if one server went down, you know, things just went nuts. It's, it's hard because, you know, you've invested time and money into this architecture, um, and nobody gives you time to go fix it, right? It's always new features, new stuff. So when we got into uh, Kubernetes, we started doing continuous integration, continuous delivery. And so we started doing things like, we had a goal of releasing 10 times a day. That seems ridiculous. Until you actually start doing it. And we've released 25 times a day with Kubernetes. So we were in this kind of sweet spot where we've adopted Kubernetes. We've taken a couple things and moved them in Docker containers we still have some of this architecture here, but we've taken these web logic nodes and we've shrunk them down. We've put them in, some of them into Kubernetes and now we're ready uh, to kind of start this journey. What's going on though is we are going to get rid of three of our five data centers and move them all into Oracle Cloud. Not just for Kubernetes, for everything. So when we told our boss this, she was like, we're, we're nuts. And she's right. Um, we had three, we had five data centers, three of them um, were just super expensive. We were paying money for legacy hardware, legacy network racks, um, slow one gigabit network between, between servers, it wasn't pretty. So the idea was let's converge onto the Oracle, uh, the OCI platform. And while we're doing this, don't just lift and shift the workload, but actually take the time, spend the money, spend the resources and move and improve it. So we're gonna modernize our WebLogic. We're running a version of WebLogic um, from 2007. Not so great. Um, and we've been kind of pinning that version for a lot of different reasons, but now we have an impetus if we're gonna to go to the Oracle Cloud and use JCS, which is their Java uh, cloud services that are basically running WebLogic 12 behind the scenes. We need to get to WebLogic 12 and Java 8. There was no business impetus to do that before. This lets us do that. We're able to fix things, make them better. Um, and so we're gonna take 
what we have and we're going to move and improve it. This also, this reconsideration of our architecture allows us to consider scaling in a different way. Instead of having a pool of nodes that are all kind of pointing to each other that are sketchy at times, um, be able to actually plan it from the beginning. How do we make this work in Oracle Cloud? Because we're not going to be able to move a server up there and do the same things we did before. Our, as a temporary procurement uh, vendor management system, we have two really busy days. We have Fridays when people enter time cards and Mondays when people approve them. The ability to auto scale on those two days is gonna save us a ton of money because our, our workload on those days we can scale up to whatever the demand is and our customer experience is gonna be a lot better. And then as that load comes down on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're gonna see a lot of savings because we can actually scale that, turn those servers off. So that's gonna be great. So how do we do this? How do we move and improve? How do we converge all these data centers? How do we make our plan work? So the first thing we've been doing is taking all the kind of auxiliary systems and moving them up to the cloud. So we've moved several Splunk instances from AWS into the Oracle Cloud. Um, this allows our logging to be running on faster disk. We saw like a, it's like a five-fold improvement of performance just by moving it to the Oracle Cloud because with, I don't know if you know about AWS um, disks, but you have to pay for the IOPS. Well, in the Oracle Cloud, the standard IOPS are so much higher than what we were even paying for in AWS, it was ridiculous. So we're actually um, saving money on our instances and they're a lot faster. We're also moving our application monitoring platform in Stano, uh, putting that foundation in and moving our continuous delivery for delivery pipeline up to the cloud as well. So we've got Jenkins, GitLab, Nexus, Docker, those kind of things. So once you have that foundation laid, our next step is to move DR in there. So that's a pretty scary thing for us. So we have bare metal exadatas that we own today. We're going to use bare metal exadatas up in the Oracle Cloud as our DR site. So we'll be doing DR, a data guard replication up there to it. We're gonna stand up new Kubernetes clusters up there to handle a copy of all of our services that are running. And then that way we can auto scale it. And then we're gonna take some of our legacy large VMs and move them up to the cloud. And that'll be our DR site. So another thing that allows us to do what we're doing is we're able to eliminate a lot of older legacy systems. So things that have been deprecated, just finally get the chance to delete them. We have several hundred Tomcat servers that are actually um, part of an architecture we had that we've moved away from. We can actually turn those off, get rid of them, or if there's a service or two left in there that you actually kind of still need, we containerize them and move in, into Docker and then put that in Kubernetes. So that's been a great simplification for us. And finally, our, um, our upgrade plan. So again, we were running pretty old versions of uh, Oracle database. We're running 11.203. We're gonna move that to 12.2 which should give us some pretty amazing optimizer performances. We've got an Exadata X5, so moving from an X5 to an X6, and probably in the spring an X7 will give us a vast amount of performance increase. So those are like the first steps we're taking to actually finalize our DR move, we're gonna actually try <laughs> our DR uh, migration several times. Uh, we're gonna practice the, the failover. We've got a design in place so that we can have easy rollback if it's unsuccessful. Um, and then eventually the plan is, once we're confident in our DR site, we're actually gonna do a failover and stay. We're gonna stick. So the DR site will move, um, it'll become the primary, and then what we have today will be our backup site. Now, 
it seems kind of scary, but when you think about the performance gains we have just in the DR site from the increase in hardware, it's a huge improvement for us. And then what we do is we try to move that DR site, which is now our primary, up to the cloud, and we're completely in the cloud. So here is a diagram, and it's probably a little bit of an R, R chart for you guys, and I'm sorry, but the end state for us is we have um, three availability of zones in Ashburn. They're running a Kubernetes cluster, a JCS cluster. They're all intertwined with RabbitMQ. They've got a coherence cache, all fronting an Oracle database. Our DR site will be in Phoenix, but it's also hitting our current uh, prod database, so we can actually do scaling across that. So if we have peak load times, we can use a, another availability zone if we want to. We're still determining whether or not the latency is good around that or not. Um, that's kind of where we're going, so see a lot of benefits with that architecture for us. Here's some of our lessons learned. We have, um, we have noticed that if you go out online and you're looking at uh, documentation to try to figure out can uh, Oracle's implementation of Kubernetes do what you're expecting it to do, what we found is that documentation is usually out of date because um, they are moving so fast. Now the great part of that is they're moving really fast and you can provide feedback to them and they actually listen to it. And we've seen that firsthand. We've seen the care that the developers are taking in making this a, a great platform going forward. So it's really pretty exciting for us to be able to say, you know, I didn't like this part. We need some extra shapes because the shapes you have today aren't exactly the shapes we'd like to run. So how can you help us out? We'd like to run these things on the host, or we need things like um, uh, the developer kernel hooks, so we could run, let's say, uh, StatsD or some other tool directly on the host. They're like, okay, yeah, we can do that. That's been pretty impressive because uh, it's such, such a large company and it's so much of a focus, it's pretty cool. Um, and what we've also learned is by taking these little baby steps, um, we get our feet wet, we get experience in what we're doing. We're not saying all of a sudden, hey, we're gonna do our DR in the cloud and everybody's like, yeah, that's dumb. No, actually we've gained experience, we've gained confidence, we've gained practical knowledge. We've been working with the Oracle teams closely, we feel confident and now we can move, move forward. And the other thing that's been great for us is we're able to reconsider our architecture, take this opportunity to actually improve some things and make our customers a lot happier. A couple things I'd also say on, specifically on Kubernetes, um, the OK platform is probably the easiest part of our entire migration. We've had to do a lot of version upgrades, but Kubernetes is just working. It just, it's just solid. We tried this thing for a little while called, we'll call it a split cluster, where we kept the Kubernetes control plane local to our environment and then spun up extra nodes in Oracle Cloud. We thought maybe we could do something like that where we have you know, 20 nodes here at our data center and then we add 10 up in the cloud. The networking required for that was uh, beyond our capability. It was difficult. Um, and so we ended up abandoning it for standing up just a separate cluster that Oracle managed. It moved a lot faster for us. And very pleased with how that worked. Um, and now we're starting our JCS transi transition where we're taking our WebLogic 12 servers and moving them to JCS. We expect, expect that to be extremely simple because um, they're running, JCS is really running WebLogic 12 behind the scenes and we've put in the due diligence, we've done the consideration, we've done the design work, we feel really confident in where we're going with that. So um, with that, I'll turn, that, turn it back over to Dave. Thanks, Jason. So if, if we, if we kind of take a step back for a second and we talk about hybrid again, so um, I just wanna, I, I wanna verify with you the, the, like what I heard, right, which is, you started with a lift and shift, which is 
one of the you know one of the primary use cases for hybrid, and then um, you're migrating towards a DR in the cloud with production on prem, and then eventually you're going to switch that over, right. right? And so, go ahead. Every everything on that slide other than burst, I think we're touching on. <laughs> right, right. So it's so it's been and it's been really good. And I know you know you and I have been talking for a while about this, and then um, so. Where you are now, like you actually have things set up in Oracle, in yep. like OCI, and it's working, right? Right. We actually do have, um, like I said, we've got Splunk, a lot of our control plane up there. We've got a lot of our uh, pipeline for our build um, up there. We've got Kubernetes clusters that are working up there. We've got services deployed. Um, we're, we've got a database. We're starting. Um, moving a dev environment up there uh, starting next week, and that'll have everything, the entire stack top to bottom, F5s, routing, firewall, all that stuff will move up there next week. And we expect to be done with our transition probably in the middle of Q2 next year. Right. So it's not just we hope it'll all work. It's like we're doing it. It's working yeah. so far, too. Excellent. Excellent. So um, just to kind of put a bow around this a little bit too is you know when we talk about um, Oracle support for hybrid cloud um, so I did start talking about you know Oracle con um, the container engine for Kubernetes uh, built on Oracle cloud right that's a, a piece that Beeline is using um, and really it's meant to be like I said enterprise grade out of the box it's there uh, really meant to be e the most easy thing to use um, then if you want to run Kubernetes on premises um, Oracle provides as part of the Linux offering um, a, a packaging of Kubernetes and, and installation and management tooling that goes along with that. So for the on-prem world, um, that's you know, one option to use, you know, use your own existing hardware. And then, um, so Oracle has a product called Cloud a Customer, and it is a, you know, a rack of servers and networking and storage that you know, Oracle owns. Um, you say you wanna put this in your data center, Oracle installs it, sets it up behind your firewall, uh, we send professional services on site to actually do all the setup for you, and then you purchase it through uh, so through a subscription model. You basically say, okay, I, I'm going to subscribe to X amount. There are minimums for the amount of, of um, infrastructure that you would buy, um, and then you can run that same Oracle Linux as setup is you know tested and supported to run on um, on Oracle Cloud a customer. So summary, right? It's the Kubernetes stuff is really is really you know amazing when it comes to you know the world of hybrid cloud right or hybrid you know, hybrid cloud scenarios. Um, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Kubernetes enables that encapsulation, enables portability, um, enables that rapid dev cycle right. So we heard uh, from Jason that it went from um, I can't remember what the releases were, but then you went to like ten times a day, the twenty five times a day. Yeah, we were going once a month. So and once a month to twenty five times a day. To twenty five. I mean, it's remarkable, right? Um, and then, you know, Kubernetes really, it's, you know, cloud scale orchestration. You, you don't need to scale your team to be able to scale your environment, right? It's, it's built to be really to do cloud scale and, and it's, it's built to take away the challenges of managing so many containers like that, that you know, <laughs> the port picture that I showed early on. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really the piece. And then Oracle offers, you know, Kubernetes in the cloud ready for you. Hybrid is common in the real world, right? We hear it from Beeline, and I gotta tell you, I've heard it from just about every customer who I've talked to who says, yep, we're moving to the cloud. We're, you know, adopting a container native strategy, and it's really, it's this whole process. It's, you know, it's this, none of this is unique, right? This is, it's the same journey that we're, a lot of people are on. And so I hope this was, you know, interesting and valuable to say, okay, here's somebody who's actually gone through it, lived the pain, um, and he's telling you what the pain is. Um, and then Oracle support for hybrid is really the things I talked about, right? Container services, cloud a customer, and of course, Oracle Cloud. Uh, hopefully this was valuable, and uh, it's beer time. <laughs> Thank you.